here we are. All right. Okay, here we have, uh, all right, anybody have any differentials on this? What's that? Not TFI, yeah. Uh, they're usually more pale. Yeah, it could be an SK. Um, you know, it's got that kind of like that other differential we saw earlier, where it's acanthosis, nigricans. So you get a little hyperkeratosis, a little bit of acanthosis, and then you've got this kind of a, sort of this papillomatous that's sort of subtle. So uh, this one happened to be confluent and uh, reticulated papillomatosis, but, uh, you know, a seborrheic keratosis. An epidermal nevus can do this, especially this sort of up and down kind of uh, uh, architecture um, and acanthosis nigricans. So epidermal nevus, yeah. So this was carp. All right, what's this material? Calcium, right? Pretty much anything purple in Durham Path is uh, calcium. So this is, yeah, so this is a calcinosis cutis, but it's a specific uh, entity that's known clinically called a subepidermal calcified nodule. And uh, that's its own entity, and it's usually in kids. And it's usually, if I recall correctly, like a head and neck area where they present and they've got something that looks like a cyst or a pilometricome or something. And it gets biopsied and it's just this aggregate of uh, calcium. They, they call it subepidermal because it kind of just jams up uh, on the undersurface of the uh, epidermis. You can see that. So subepidermal calcified nodules is a distinct entity. All right. And then uh, this one. Sarcoid, yep. So uh, multiple sarcoidal granulomas, you know, there's a little bit of lymphocytic inflammation. You can get some of that with sarcoid. That doesn't mean it's not. But yeah, this is really great for sarcoid. Yeah, I mean, usually you're always going to kind of stain this uh, for fungal and atypical mycobacteria and all that and polarization microscopy to make sure the foreign body, but that's good for sarcoid. There's another... Do you have any thoughts on this one? Um, so there's a follicle there, but the, you know this amount of lymphocytic inflammation at low power, the lymphocytes kind of take over a little bit. It's, they're really dense, and you know, so in that center there, you're just not getting it in a nice clean section. But that center is plugged. That hair follicle is plugged in the middle, and then uh, you've got uh, this kind of interface change at the surface, atrophy, superficial and deep lymphocytic. So this is a discoid lupus. All right, family of uh, inflammatory pattern. Interface dermatitis, mm -hmm. yep. Differential. Yeah. What's that? <laughs> uh, pleva. I want a little. I want more inflammation for uh, pleva. Yeah. At, what's that? Could put SCLE on there. You said fixed drug could be on it, but we would need more. I would say more inflammation, superficial and deep with some EOS. But the epidermal changes for fixed drug definitely. Interface dermatitis with some lymphocytic inflammation is basically what it is. And so um, I would put uh, SLE, uh, dermatomyositis, uh, graft-versus-host disease, and occasionally just straight drug eruptions can sometimes give you that interface pattern. Those would be the four things. This happened to be systemic lupus erythematosus. I'm not trying to think. I don't, I don't think that the amount of mucin was so much in this particular case, but... But again, um, you, to turn it into fixed drug, give me more almost lichenoid or you know just more inflammation right there, some EOs, superficial and deep, and uh, yeah, erythema multiform. I, I think I left that off, but erythema multiform, you could. I mean, 
Yeah, I'm gonna be proud of keratinocytes from the interface. <clears throat> All right. Anyone on this one? Yeah. So this one, I think uh, a lot of you guys maybe have seen seen it before from my collections, but they just for some reason residents you just don't see this very much. So this is a tumor of the follicular infundibulum (TFI), and uh, it it exactly the tumor is exactly what it kind of sounds like. So it derives from the infundibular portion of the hair follicle, so it stays higher. Uh, those cells are uh, paler, and so the cells uh, in the tumor are a little bit paler. So here's the normal staining of the epidermis, and then notice how this is just, just a touch paler. And so these pale projections, I would say, kind of, the, and we refer to them almost like plate-like projections coming from the epidermis that are pale. And uh, you can kind of see by projection or plate light, you can see how this is sort of kind of plating out that way. And these as well, this is kind of going off this way and coming off that way. So, so we saw the fibroepithelium pinkus earlier, very different, colors very different. Um, not serogo um, very superficial. So tumor of the follicular infundibulum. You guys, I took you to it, right? Okay. What's this? Erythrasma, right? It's the same organisms, right? Pitted keratolysis. You don't think the differences in the organisms. They keep changing the names to uh, Corinobacterium. Okay, yeah, okay, yeah. So same uh, thing, just a different clinical uh, picture. So so erythrasma at low power, uh, you know, mild spongiotic, chronic psoriasis form dermatitis. But the, the thing, uh, also the clue on these, when you're looking at these at low power is this stratum corneum is a bit compacted, you know. If there's a clue, that, that's what it is. And infections in the epidermis can cause some compaction of the stratum corneum, whether it's erythrasma, pitocaritolysis, tinea versicolor, uh, regular tinea can sometimes cause a little compaction. So maybe a low power, if you're seeing nothing else, maybe a low power clue to, to make you think to go and look a little closer. faded out, but trichoadenoma. Yeah, you guys good? Good. All right. Yeah. See these very often. Right? Trichoadenoma. This one. Yep, nevus lipomatosis. Yep. Fat doesn't belong there. It's in the dermis. It's the thigh, buttock area is usually where I see these submitted from? So anidoderma is going to be more like uh, you're going to get some like atrophic areas within the dermis and sometimes you'll get elastic. Sometimes you get a little bit of fat herniation okay. in some of those but not not as a rule. This is where the fat is sort of like taken over. Yeah. I do have duplicates. I, I did buy. What, what about this one here? BP. Yep. A lot of EOs. And was that? Yeah, that was hair cyst. This one, what's that? Yeah, it's a bunch of crust and stuff in there. But uh, this is uh, going into squamous carcinoma in situ. In some areas, it's AK. Um, but this is kind of approaching full thickness atypia. Cells are uh, disordered, hyperchromatic, occasional mitotic figures, 
normal epidermis here, but then it's starting into uh, a little hyperplastic with foci of full thickness atypia. Squamous of carcinocytes. And this. What's that? This, I think, is a, uh, a, a was an angiokeratoma that kind of got traumatized and, and left a little blood at the stratum corneum. So you got a little, actually, vascular sp spaces um, underneath. So you get a little hyperkeratosis, a little epidermal hyperplasia. And in angiokeratoma, the vascular spaces sort of, sort of kind of push into the undersurface of the epidermis. This one, that's amyloid, yeah, so um, uh, this is more kind of lichen, uh, although it's a small focus in here, they're overall, you know, that amount of amyloid, it fits more with uh, lichen rather than a macular, sort of, and uh, hyperkeratosis, a epidermal hyperplasia, so this fits better, fits clinically too. All right, this. Neurofibroma. Yeah. You saw the mess earlier? Yeah. 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 We had it. There's a couple in that field, I think. So, yeah, actually, there's a mass cell right here. So. Actually, this one tends to have there's a larger mass cell there. So, yeah. So, neurofibroma. Differential. I keep doing this kind of thing. So, uh, I just a nine year old kid with a little thing on his upper back. <laughs> Epidermal nevus, yeah, so 85-year-old man with something on his back, SK, velvety hyperpigmented plaques on the center of the chest carp, and then velvety on the neck, acanthosis nigricans. This one I... When I did read it, I, I waffled a little bit on this one, but um, this really, to me, looks like a clonal seborrheic keratosis, you know. The, the reason I sort of paused on this is, that, you know, I thought, well, is there a little atypia, you know, is this like a clonal Bowens or something like that? But I just, I didn't think they did, there was any real prominent atypia. I think just the cells, clones of these cells just have a different morphology. I had also paused briefly, but I, it, it doesn't look like it. Hydroacanthoma simplex. You start to kind of see that picture, and I don't know if I completely ruled that out in my mind, but anyway, it's a clonal SK. In between the clonal areas, it looks like SK uh, as well. So. I was looking for a better slide on this one, but um, this is the best I could find. But any thoughts on this? I think it's a, it's my fault on this one because I just couldn't find a good one. But you see that that inflammation is sort of occupying a couple dermal papilla, uh, like it is. Yeah, yeah. So, and here, you know, it was excoriated, and it's sort of, you know, it's just there's it's blood in there. It's excoriated, so it just doesn't look like a nice textbook one. But this is more like it. So there's some histiocytes in there as well. So it's a limp. And I think it's just kind of got this sort of like some of the histiocytes create these little clearish spaces. So that, you know, sometimes that's throwing it off a little bit. But yeah, so like did this. How about this one? Yeah, yeah. This was clinically macular and, but. Most of the macular amyloids that I see don't have amyloid this obvious. Usually it's very subtle and you might just say as yeah, suggestive of am uh, macular amyloid. It's just real subtle or you, you might stain it. But So there's macular amyloid. It's globules. It's not material. And here's another slide. I searched and searched for something better because this, this, I don't like this one exactly, but what are your thoughts on it? Haley, Haley, yeah, yes, Haley, full thickness. I think uh, people, when I've shown this before, you will throw an off follicular involvement, and then you start to think about pemphigus and stuff. So um, maybe I can just say hey, over on this end here, you've got 
areas of full thickness acantholysis, dilapidated brick wall. So. But all the crusting and stuff in the inertrogenous areas is pretty typical for Haley Haley too. All right, and this one here. Yeah, so the axillary granular, so see the granularity, especially like right here. This is this granular stuff right here, along with parakeratosis right here, so thickened stratum corneum. So this is axillary granular parakeratosis. Everyone got that? Yeah. All right. And then how about this one? What's that? Yeah, yeah. Might have been excoriated or traumatized or something, but small focus of uh, acantholysis. And it stays in the plane pretty much of the epidermis, not like a warty disc keratoma that goes down like that. And, you know, theoretically, you know, there's maybe a couple of dyskeratotic cells in here. So in the right clinical context, this could be uh, Derrier's disease. Um, so if we want to convert it to Haley Haley, we just saw one a second ago. Usually the epidermis is a little bit more thick and you get this dilapidated full thickness uh, acantholysis with no dyskeratosis. Uh, Pemphigus vulgaris we saw, and this could be a focus of Pemphigus vulgaris, but typically you like to see that very broad across the larger front, maybe that tombstone effect. Um, Pemphigus foliaceus we saw, that's a superficial kind of acantholysis, different uh, from this. So. All right, good. Molluscum. Sometimes I get the cystic, you know, submitted as cyst or submitted as something. So sometimes I get completely sort of a, almost like dermal kind of cystic uh, stuff when I see that they didn't know what it was. And so. Or they get an intense inflammatory reaction and you can't see the clinical hallmarks of the molluscum and they might, you know, say, you know, it's a cyst or something. All right, here's a good one. Any thoughts on this? There can be some differential on this, but pernio. Yep, this is pernio. Show blains. Yep. So um, you've got uh, kind of sense it's acral. See the stratum corneum and a little bit of uh, uh, epidermal hyperplasia. So your stratum corneum. You got this so somewhat kind of lichenoid, dense infiltrate, superficial and deep. You got some macrine involvement, uh, but the acral is kind of a nice clue. If you think about the lichen strait, as we saw earlier, this is a little reminiscent of that, I think, and uh, it's sort of psoriasis form, although that, some of that's acral, and then it's kind of lichenoid, superficial, and deep. So, uh, so anyway, this is a perineo. When you have a psoriasis form and lichenoid, you mentioned uh, the secondary syphilis is on the differential, mycosis fungoides, and a shave of lichen striatus shave of pernio. So there's a bunch of entities that will sort of give you sometimes that psoriasis form lichenoid appearance. But the main two for psoriasis from lichenoid are really uh, secondary syphilis and MF. Pernio. How about this one? Nevis comedonica, CLA, yeah. Fiber record show could be a differential, right? Yep. Or a kid with acne, a bunch of comedones that are clustered. Nevis comedonicus. What you guys put for this? Yeah, so this is. Uh, uh, reticular histiocytoma. Although, although when I was showing this to you, I saw something that looked like a two-ton yeah, yeah. in, in the I middle of like it, and then I, yeah, there was a little two-ton yeah. type of thing. Yeah. But I think uh, so. Yeah, I got a little surprised when I saw that, but I still think it's a reticular histiocytoma because the uh, the appearance of the cells. Remember, we saw that other reticular history, that those large, almost kind of purplish, you know, huge cytoplasm in you know, other cells. A 
I think this is one of Danielle Wayma or one of our associates here, her patient who's got a some kind of uh, she has a leukemia, I think, so some kind of association of multiple reticular histocytomas. Got it. Yeah, I've really lied to you guys. There's more more of these here, so <coughs> subvertebral cleft, eosinophils, olospemphigoid. Could be herpes, or what do they call it now? Pemphigoid gestationis. Yeah, so that could be on the differential. How about this one? Well, when it was yeah. So, I mean, if it was, you know, on an 85-year-old arm or something, it would be in situ. But there's a little bit of a difference between squamous cell carcinoma in situ and bovinoid papulosis. One, um, these are usually intraturgicous areas, and they usually don't get that quick uh, hyperkeratotic and parakeratotic sort of surface that a typical SCC in situ gets, say, on an arm or a face or something. And then, uh, sort of classically, you got almost like a scatter of uh, necrotic keratinocytes. Um, uh, throughout the thing, and sometimes a little bit of a scatter of mitotic figures. Uh, so there are some kind of differences. You might see little foci where it also looks like a, a coelicidic change. Sometimes you'll see that. But uh, and these all, I often get these submitted as you know atypical nevus, you know, in a groin area or something. So. If I read it for a non-derm or something. Um, I'll usually take a little precaution, like uh, I'll call bone papulosis, and then I'll put in some stuff about some, you know, an allergy to squamous cell carcinoma in situ, possibly by HPV or by HPV. But I usually even kind of call some of that because sometimes you're in a groin area and somebody, you know, sees anything SEC, they might get a little overly aggressive with the treatment and stuff. So derms, just they, they're good. They know, they, they know the entity. This one, Merkel cell, yeah. He's kind of smudged, you know, to said. I've used this before, but somebody called the cells murky, you know, like a swamp or something. It's just, it's just kind of very typical. Some of these cells remind me a little bit of that sebaceous uh, carcinoma we saw earlier. So Merkel cell carcinoma. Differential on this one. Yeah, those two. Yeah, so uh, PIH and you said erythema dyschromicum perstans. And this was erythema dyschromicum perstans in one of our patients recently. You can get a little bit of subtle, sort of kind of like there's an interface kind of process uh, if you catch the lesion at a certain stage. But uh, so, ashydermatosis, erythema dyschromicum first stands. What was this one? Condyloma. Yep. Keratosis, prominent epidermal hyperplasia. There's a little bit of like a pale and sort of um, I don't know, uh, almost like windblown kind of uh, patterning to the keratinocytes. This one had a little bit more obvious in terms of the coelocytosis in some areas. So this would be condyloma acuminatum. I always say I'm a little careful when I sign these out if the coelocytosis and the features aren't real good. Uh, I sometimes will hedge it a little bit on purpose because the implications of telling somebody they have, you know, genital warts and stuff, it, it can, and I heard of a case that wound up, uh, back when I was in Texas, it wound up in a lawsuit because it was called condyloma, but it wasn't, and it created all this strife in the household and stuff, so, uh, yeah, wound up in a lawsuit, so I'll, I'll hedge these a little bit, if you know, but this is straight, straight uh, straightforward, so. Or I'll sometimes offer uh, uh, PCR or, or something to try to solidify it. We usually send those at clinics sometimes. All right, how about this one? Yeah, yeah, solid cystic adenoma. 
so uh, there's the cystic, right? And then uh, here's some of the solid. And uh, the nomenclature for all these entities is, is really messed up and it's all over the place. But, uh, but for instance, for, for this one here, you've got these just large areas of uh, sort of large nodules. And within those nodules, there's some cystic areas like we see here, and then there's some solid cellular areas. And those solid cellular areas can vary from, they, they can look like clear cells, and it is, a, it is clear in some areas, like, um, like some of these are starting to look kind of clearish, especially right here. Look at, this is like a real clear cell focus. Uh, they can look almost like squamous in some areas. Um, and then they almost look like monotonous and uniform in other areas, almost like a paroma. So it's got all these different morphologies uh, that it can be. And so if I want to sort of take this uh, hydradenoma and turn it into more of a solid overall picture, I might call it a nodular hydradenoma. If I wanted to turn it uh, into all these clear cells, like that one focus I showed you, and just let the clear cells sort of take over most of this, then I might call it a clear cell hydradenoma. Uh, it's got these solid cystic areas, so we can call this solid cystic hydradenoma. Uh, if it wasn't so cystic here, I'd call it a nodular So it's all over, but at the end of the day, it's kind of a hydradenoma. And then this one. Epithelioma, yep. The basaloid, as opposed to the sebaceous adenoma we saw earlier, which had maybe two, three layers kind of of basaloid germinative blue cells, this is getting five, six, seven, and in some areas it's sort of taken, feeling like it's starting to take over some of the lobules. So that, uh, so you get that proliferation of the basaloid cells. You also get a proliferation of the lobules, uh, more lobules going a little bit deeper, and so, you know, sebaceous epithelioma. If we took it a step further and those blue cells are sort of taking over, and then you throw some atypical cells in there, that's when we're starting to move into sebaceous uh, carcinoma. I almost always get the uh, micro uh, satellite instability uh, tests on this MLH1, MSH6, PMS2, all those. Uh, and uh, they can be really helpful. It's a great test. It can give you a lot of information. So. This one? This is the yeah, yeah. The other one had this on the surface, but some, of course, well, let me see here. No, telomore. Okay. I don't know if underneath there or something. And this one? Mestocytoma, yep. Toluidin blue, uh, CD117, it's called C-Kit. It, it, it's not necessary uh, in this one here, but if, if there was some debate about something, you could get those stains. What was this? Blue Nevis. Blue Nevis, yeah. So I often get, here's the shave, and then they saw that, oh, wait, there's pigment underneath, so they're going to reshave. So when they reshaved it, they got the pigment right here and they shaved it down to this level. This, uh, you could just stick this piece right on top of this piece and it would be one piece. <laughs> and then these were just nothing here. So blue nevus, and then if I wanted to take uh, this blue nevus and turn it into uh, Oda, Edo, or Mongolian spot, then uh, what would I do? What's that? They're, they're a little bit longer sometimes, they're more dendritic. Um, I would make them less dense. So in those Oda, Edo, Mongolian, they're they're scattered kind of throughout the dermis. So they're not more limited to the upper portion of the dermis. And then they're scattered and more sparse. A bit subtle. I mean, it might be one of those nothing differentials. When you pull it up, you're not seeing much. And then you look a little closer and you see these little scattered dendritic cells. So, But the same basic cell. It's a dendritic melanocyte. Have repeats here. This was, yeah. You could probably flip a coin. I think uh, I might call it a glomangioma. Yeah. Vascular space. This one, yeah. Although uh, LSNA, this homogenized stuff, you have to stop right up here. But it's all going all the way down into here. So yeah, this is 
chronic radiation dermatitis. Again, you know, LSNA. This is great up here for LSNA, but it's got to stop right here. And this goes well beyond that. There are some LSNA morphia overlaps that it can go a little bit deeper, but I don't think they would give you that. This one, yeah, the pens were writing quick on that one. Sclerotic fibroma cow dens, P10. GA, right? You guys all good with that? Okay, GA, little palisades and mucin. And this one. Yeah, yep. See this mounds of perikeratosis. The spongiosis is there, and I always call it almost a muted spongiosis, where you get just sort of a mild spongiosis that's distributed pretty nice and evenly across it. It doesn't usually get to an acute vesicle, uh, and then, you know, little lymphohistocytic infiltrate. I don't spend too much time looking for red blood cells or anything like that, but the mounds are a nice low-power clue with some spongiosis. Differential for this could be just a spongiotic dermatitis that happens to mound a little bit. Uh, superficial subtype of uh, EAC, erythema malar centrifugum, could do this, as opposed to the regular EAC, which doesn't have the epidermal changes. We saw that earlier, cuffed lymphocytes, superficial ND. All right, PR. How about this one? That? Yeah, hemocytorotic uh, DF, um, the terminology a little bit, sclerosing hemangioma, subtype of a DF, so, yeah. I had trained, we were more used to calling this sclerosing hemangioma, but it's got, uh, it's got a lot of hemocytorotic.